Uh, so thanks a lot for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, mobility yet for levy vacancy. So let me start by uh, going back and, and discussing something that is well studied by this term, which are called Vigner matrices. So Vigner matrices are, are basically by definition symmetric random matrices whose entries are independent, identically distributed, and they allow a finite variance. So independent up to the up to the symmetric condition. So one example of it's kind of a pseudo example is the is the is the GOE uh, whose entries are all Gaussian of the same variance. The slight technicality that technically the, uh, the diagonal entries are, are slightly different variants from the off diagonal entries, but this is um, a good thing to keep in mind uh, in the back of your mind is the GOE. Okay, so Wigner matrices have been extensively studied over the past you know, uh, six and a half decades, uh, dating back to the work of, of Wigner in 1955, who studied the, the global law, the sum of the, so the, the global law of the eigenvalues. So you can think of it like the eigenvalue histogram. If you take a Wigner matrix, uh, look at what its eigenvalues, and they'll converge to the, the so called semi circle law, which is shown over here. Um, so that's on the sort of the global scale. On, on, on a more fine scale, you can ask questions about the eigenvectors and sort of spacings of the eigenvalues. So um, on, on the level of eigenvectors, uh, the works of or the Schlein Yao and Burgad Yao, so they showed that um, eigenvectors are delocalized, which I mean, I'll, I'll be somewhat informal here, but basically what that means is that any sparse subset of eigenvector entries, if I take some eigenvector of a, of a Wigner matrix, then any sparse subset of, of, of its entries can't carry too much, too much say L2 mass. The opposite of this would be what we call, I mean, the opposite of delocalization is what you call localization, which means that there do, does exist some sparse subset of the entries of, an, uh, of some vector that carries a lot of its mass. But I mean, for these bigger matrices, it was shown that, um, uh, that they're always delocalized. Okay, so that's on the level of eigenvectors and the level of eigenvalues. Um, it was shown uh, these sort of independent works that um, that there's a universality result for the the local eigenvalue spacing. So I take two second consecutive eigenvalues, or maybe every other eigenvalue. I look at its spacings, some random quantity. I scale that difference up, and this will converge to some universal limit that does not depend on the laws of these entries. So these entries could, in principle, be um, arbitrary as long as they have finite variance. Regardless of what, what they are, they converge to the, these level spacings. These eigenvalue spacings converge to those of the GOE, which had been computed by Godin and, and Meta uh, 60 years ago. So sort of the opposite, I mean, and I write opposite in quotes here because you can't really have the opposite of a probability distribution. But morally speaking, these GOE major, these GOE level spacings are, are, are they, they come from highly correlated systems. So kind of the opposite would be a kind of a statistic that appears in very independent systems, which would be uh, the, the Poisson, would be a Poisson, Poisson random variable. So if you take a Poisson point process, look at the spacings of those, those are morally speaking be kind of the opposite of a, of a GOE level spacing. Right. So now these are these are concerning bigger matrices, which are matrices whose entries allow finite variance. And then what I want to do is I want to drop this assumption of finite variance. So I'm going to take, so the basic question of this talk will be, I mean, how do random symmetric matrices behave if their entries have infinite variance? Um, so just to set up notation, we'll fix an a parameter alpha, which is in 0, 2, uh, which is kind of going to tell me how many moments or what the tail of my probability density is. And I'll let x be some random variable that has tail t to the minus alpha. So the probability that x is, is at least t is, is scaling like t to the minus alpha. And um, sort of the, the condition that is somewhat standard condition that you put on x is that X is what you call uh, in the domain of attraction of an alpha stable law. So in English, what that means is that, uh, okay, I take this, I, I've said that this probability that scales like T to the minus alpha, I multiply by T to the alpha, and I get some quantity L of T, you should view this as kind of uh, some tame quantity. And the statement is that this doesn't vary too much. So, uh, okay, this is a somewhat technical condition, you know, it, it, some, some kind of limit tends to one, but you can just view this as this tends to a constant and you won't lose much. <laughs> a very basic example is that um, you can you can take like a power law like this. Okay, but of course there are many others. So a Levy matrix is, is by definition a symmetric random matrix. Um, H, which I'll often denote by H, it's n by n. Its upper triangular entries are mutually independent, and they all have this law n uh, n to the minus one over alpha. So this is some scaling times this random variable x. So they're all IID. The only difference is now that I, I use this infinite variance random variable X instead of a finite variance one. 
Okay. And this normalization enter the minus one over alpha. If alpha is two, then I'm kind of in the Wigner case where I have finite variance. Um, then um, this normalization minus one over alpha is 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 uh, made in order to make all the eigenvalues of order one. So most of the under this normalization, most of the eigenvalues will be of order one. So uh, so yeah. Okay. So well, why 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 do this? Okay. So um, so I mean, other than the fact that it's a fairly natural question, I mean, there, there are many reasons to study Levy matrices. I mean, one is that there there are um, heavy tailed random variables are often better suited than say finite variance one to model various various phenomena such as networks or, or models in, in, in mathematical physics. Um, another uh, another reason is that uh, it, you, you find um, new asymptotic phenomena that appear in the high dimensional limits. Um, and in particular, one that we'll focus on in this talk is the so-called mobility edge or Anderson transition, which you can view as a sharp, sharp transition from localized to delocalized eigenvectors. So this will be one of the focuses of this talk. So let me let me start from kind of the bottom, which is the, the global law again. So I, as, you, as I just, as, as I mentioned before, if I have a Wigner matrix, the global law is a semicircle law. That immediately changes when I go to a Levy matrix. So if I take some n by n Levy matrix, you can define the so-called empirical spectral distribution, which is uh, some measure, okay? So it's, um, I, I put a delta mass on any of these lambda i's, I, I should say are the eigenvalues of my matrix H. So I put a delta mass on each of the eigenvalues and I, and I average them up. So this is gonna give me some, some empirical spectral distribution. So again, for, for being matrices, this converges to the sum circle law. For Levy matrices, they do not. So it was shown by Venerou and DNA about 15 years ago that uh, this ESD, uh, parallel spectral distribution, converges to some measure rho alpha uh, of x dx. And it's sort of, um, it's PDF, like the probability density function of this thing is not, is not entirely explicit, but you can, you can come up with some explicit-ish definition of it through its still just transform. So it's still just transform is by definition, uh, if you have any measure rho of alpha, you take this integral x minus the inverse times rho of alpha x dx. If I know this for all z, I can recover the ESD back. Uh, and then you can, you can pin down what this still just transform is through some family fixed point equations that I'm not going to write down. Okay, so there is some explicit des description of this, of, this, um, of this density function. And a few qualitative properties is that it's symmetric and it's smooth and it's non-compactless uh, non important. So this is an immediate distinction from what you see in the, uh, in, in, in the bigger case. So in particular, these, the, the, the tails of this global law Kind of behave, behave are, are, are heavy tailed in, in itself. So like uh, rho of alpha of x uh, is like x is, is is falling off like x to the minus alpha. So this non-compact support is, is a qualitative difference for what you see in the in the Wigner case. Excuse me. Yes, but the different figures correspond to different values of alpha. Absolutely, yeah. So that's the that would be Cauchy. Cauchy is the this one. <laughs> Yeah, so alpha is 1.5, you kind of see that you're getting close to a semicircle. Um, but if alpha is cushy, it looks like this. And if alpha gets smaller, smaller, with more and more heat. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay, so, so now we, let, me, like, let me get to uh, these sort of mobility edge predictions. So uh, the original work of Cizzo and Bachot uh, back around 25 or 30 years ago, made the original kind of eigenvector and eigenvalue predictions for what you should see in these Levy matrices. Uh, the thing is, uh, and a lot of the work was based on you know, numerics. And the thing about heavy tail random variables is if you ever try to do numerics on them, they're not very reliable. So actually some of the predictions 20 years ago, 25 years ago, computers were at a different level. Um, some of the predictions had to be had to be modified in, in somewhat recent years. Um, so this more recent work of Tarkini, Brilla, and, and Tarja provided new, uh, slightly different predictions, and I'll I'll say what those are. Okay. So um, okay. So the predictions are as follows. So alpha. So alpha is a parameter. Right? It tells me what the tail is. So if alpha is it's between zero and two. So if alpha is between one and two, then the prediction is that you should see. All of the spacings, the level spacings of the eigenvalues should converge to those of the GOE throughout the spectrum. If I take any point, any sort of finite point in the spectrum, this should be given by the GOE. And any such eigenvector, if I have a kind of a finite eigenvalue, it should be delocalized. Okay, so I kind of see qualitatively speaking throughout the spectrum, at least if I look at like compact or any compact interval, I should have a I should have kind of qualitatively what you see in the bigger case. 
Now, more interestingly, is if, if alpha is less than one, so this is when you're when you're uh, when you're random, your entries have infinite mean and not only infinite variance, then you should see what, what's known as, a, what's sometimes known as a mobility edge or an Anderson transition. So it's a point E alpha, it's some point, you view this as some point in the spectrum. So that if I pick, if I pick a point E um, that's bounded between minus E alpha and E alpha, then the, and I take any eigenvalue, and I take any sort of level spacing to eigenvalues be, uh, between minus E alpha and E alpha, then they should have a Joey kind of Joey statistics. And if I take any eigenvector, any, any eigenvector whose eigenvalue is again in this range between minus E alpha and E alpha, then that eigenvalue, then that eigenvector should be flat, it should be delocalized. Okay, contrarily, if I take a point in the spectrum who's, uh, that's in magnitude bigger than E alpha, so sort of bigger than E alpha or less than minus E alpha, then if I take two eigenvalues around there, it should be, uh, the, the spacing should be plus on. So kind of what I said is morally the opposite of GOE. And any eigenvector whose eigenvalue is again has magnitude larger than E alpha should be should be localized. So the kind of picture I have is over here. This sort of a graph here is meant to kind of mimic these uh, one of one of these graphs. So it's kind of the, the law of the distribution. And then I have these these points, this sort of range minus E alpha to E alpha. And in this region you should have GOE local statistics and eigenvector delocalization. And outside of it, you should have um, sort of Poisson statistics and localized eigenvectors. So the sharp transition from localization to delocalization is sometimes called an Anderson transition or a mobility edge. So what did what did Bouchon get wrong? Uh, so they they did not think that the transition would be sharp. So they somehow thought that there would be kind of a cloud, like there would be some region here where you'd have a mixed, you'd have kind of a mixed range. Actually, they got both of these kind of wrong in a sense. Uh, but I mean, their work was seminal, but I mean, yeah, they, they kind of, so both of these had issues. So the first is that they kind of predicted a mixed phase in both regions. And was between one and two, they, had, they thought that eigenvectors would be kind of partly, de, uh, partly localized and you would have kind of non ergodic you would have some very strange local statistic that was neither GOE nor Poisson. And then likewise predicted the same thing in this regime. And I think the issue, for example, here is at the mobility edge, if I look at finite n, it's actually it's actually not it's not so sharp for finite n. It's kind of it, the, the 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 I mean it, as n tends to infinity, you believe it, it should be sharp, but for finite n, it's it, it's it it should probably decay like some power and maybe even like inverse of log n. So if I try to run numerics on this thing, it actually does kind of look like you you, you kind of you kind of see a it doesn't look like a sharp transition. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure it's a reasonable question, but I imagine that like in physics. It is usually when you have lower energy, you tend to localize somewhere. And if it is higher energy, then it is delocalized. Can you comment a little bit on why it is? Yeah, so, okay, okay. so let, let me try to give you a, a basic uh, like a, a basic example here. So, so if I take a levy, this levy matrix, it has heavy tails, right? So in principle, a lot of, uh, I have a, a few entries are gonna be massive in this matrix. So think about the eigenvector that's just supported. It just has one, it's just like, all zeros in one, one non-zero entry. And then one, one non-zero entry kind of lines up with the largest entry of the matrix. That is almost an, like, if you kind of view that one entry of the matrix is dominating everything else, that one, that one, like that, that eigenvector is almost gonna be an eigenvalue of the matrix. I, sorry, that eigenvector, that, that vector I just described, this coordinate vector is almost going to be an eigenvector of the matrix whose eigenvalue is exactly this, this huge entry, the huge entry of the matrix. So that is kind of pointing to the fact that if I look at the highest eigenvectors, uh, so the, the eigenvectors with highest eigenvalues, those should almost be coordinate vectors. And there's a sense in which this has been made, been made kind of rigorous. Uh, in this case, the distribution is invariant under the sine flip of the energy, right. unlike the Schrodinger operator, who is a kinetic term. Yes, that, that, I mean, so that is, <laughs> that is a sort of, yeah, more, more general, you know, more general explanation, yeah. Sorry, can you say one more time how E is defined? E, so E of alpha? Or just E. Oh, E is just any point, any real number. So I'm, I'm looking, uh, so I take any real number, um, I look at any real number and I look at, I ask myself kind of, if I look at the level spacing around E, is it kind of GOE or is it plus on? And I look at the eigenvector whose eigenvalue is around B, is it localized or being local? So I'm kind of ranging E and asking myself, how does the behavior of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues change? And the claim is that if E is kind of here, if E is between these two points, then I have one behavior. If he's outside that interval, and I don't know. Yeah. So you have different types of eigen vectors of eigenvalues. Yeah. Okay. Any, other, any, any further questions? Okay. So I'll keep going then. And okay. So I have not told you what E of alpha is. 
and a, a sort of a, a remarkable feature of these lovely matrices is that it's actually ex it, it can be it can be made explicit. So I'll I'll, I'll I'll give you like half a slide of making it explicit, and I, I'll kind of stop at a point, and then I will not explain how to make the rest of it explicit. So I'll explain. Okay. So um, what do I mean by that? So you set E of alpha to be the presumably unique. It's actually not going to be obvious. Uh, e bigger than zero, such that this lambda E is equal to one. Okay, so I have to tell you what lambda is now. So lambda is the solution to it's lambda is the positive solution to this quadratic equation. This b here is going to be positive, so there's going to be one negative and one positive solution. So you take the positive one. Okay, so now I have to tell you what a and b are. So a and b are given by by these formulas. So I have a you know they, mostly they have fairly familiar things. So I have a polynomial in both of them. I have like a trigonometric thing. I have a sine, a cosine. I have a gamma function, and then I have this l of e. Okay. Okay. So I, then I have to tell you what this l of e is. So this L of E is now a kind of a half Fourier transform of something. Okay. So it's given by um, so, you know, E to the IXC, C to the alpha minus one. Alpha is the same alpha parameter. <laughs> and this hat P of uh, P E of C. And this is where I'm going to stop. Uh, so this hat, this, this P E is going to be a stable law. So this Fourier transform is pretty explicit, right? If I have a stable law, then this Fourier transform is, is like minus T to the alpha, E to the minus T to the alpha. But uh, I'm not going to tell you what its parameters are, but, uh, but there is some, some way of, of explaining what those are. So they solve some equation, and I will not write down that equation. Yeah. So does this mean the threshold E alpha doesn't depend on the law of the random variables? Correct. Besides, OK. Yeah, correct. Yes, yes. Indeed, you do not see the random variable laws, the, other than the tail parameter. You don't see the law of the random variable pairing in any of the system. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Like, does, that, does that mean that like only the tails of the entries are kind of contributing anything to the spectrum? Well, the, so the, the, the tail is kind of what's 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 governing the spectrum. The tail, yeah, the tail is what's it's kind of the thing that the bulk of the bulk of the law is kind of not telling you too much. It's the tail that's governing the spectrum. And since the tails are matching, then yeah. Okay. So so your your comment was what again? So okay, so if I just surprised the like the bulk of the Matrix entries isn't contributing anything, but I guess they're just scale, it's getting scaled. Depends on alpha, that's what you said. Yeah, it only depends on alpha, not on x. And Mark was just asking uh, if, yeah, if that was a few points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay. So this is some. Okay. So this is some. Uh, okay. So you can you can you this is not too bad actually. Um, you can, you can plot it, and people did plot it. So I mean, the mobility edge, this e alpha plotted of it against alpha shown here. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of diverging as alpha tends to one. And actually, amusingly enough, it all, you can actually tell if it's positive or zero if alpha is less than a quarter, right? <laughs> this, you're going to see you're going to see a reason for this actually. Um, there's, there's a very good reason for this, um, but um, yeah. So yeah, uh, which I'll try to explain in a few slides. Okay, so let me talk about a few previous results on eigenvector and eigenvalue behavior of these of these Levine matrices. So okay, so um, so in so the works of Bordenov and, and Guillenet, they showed various uh, delocalization results about eigenvectors. So if I look at alpha, say less than two thirds, so I mean alpha less than one should be the region, but they did take alpha less than two thirds. Then they said that eigenvectors with sufficiently large eigenvalues. So some, as long as the eigenvalue is bigger than some threshold, then they're localized. And for almost all alpha less than two, that to sort of throw out a, a, a Countable subset, then, then eigenvectors with small eigenvalues. So if it's less than some threshold little c alpha, then they're delocalized. So they kind of they showed kind of some region here and some region here. If alpha is less than two thirds, um, this one's alpha also less, less than two thirds, and this is for almost all alpha. Okay. So uh, so uh, a few years later, uh, Patrick Lopato and and and, Dow and and I we we looked at um, the eigenvalue spacings. So, and what we showed was that um, if alpha is between one and two, then you have the, eigen, the GOE spacings of the eigenvector, uh, eigenvalues, and eigenvector delocalization throughout the spectrum. Um, so, in particular, this resolves the first case of this, okay, when you don't have a mobility edge. Okay. And what we also showed is that if for almost off and zero one, you have GOE spacings again, sort of for small, for small, for small, for sufficiently small. E. So, if, if, e is, if E is small enough, like like here, then you have the GOE spacing as well. You wouldn't you wouldn't have any Tracy Widom stuff there, would you? No, no, the, the edge is kind of the, the Tracy Widom would happen if the edge is yeah, kind of no edge, is there's no edge, yeah. In that sense, yeah. Okay, so then we also uh, a few years later with, with uh, Jake Marchnik, we also looked at um, statistics of eigenvector entry. So you know you you take an eigenvector here, say in this regime where E is small. So this is sort of the delocalized regime. 
Okay, so I take some eigenvector with a pretty with some eigenvalue lambda, which is small. Okay, now if, if if the eigenvector were totally flat, I have you know I have n entries. I want the sum of the squares if the L two if it's unit if it's unit eigenvector, then I want the L two norm to be one. So each of these you should view as kind of like scaling n to the minus one half. Okay, so if I scale this, if I if I if I boost this thing up by n to the one half, this thing should be order one. And so um, you can also analyze the limit of that object of, of that of that of an eigenvector entry, um, and it converges to a, a somewhat explicit random variable, but it's not Gaussian. So it is again. What uh, in this last result? What what range are we? What alpha are we doing? Alpha is between zero and two, but lambda is small enough. So so the I so you're you're I mean so you're always you're always in this regime kind of. Okay. Yeah. You're always in the in the in the delocalized regime. So here the eigenvector should be flat. I'm kind of boosting right. up all the entries so that they become a border. Oh, but lambda's but you're you allow it to be below one. But alpha can be below one. Okay. Below one. Yeah. Alpha can even be you know between one and two, but yeah, this is most interesting when alpha is less than one. Yeah. Yeah. And then you see that the, the eigenvectors are, are not the eigenvector entries or the individual entry distributions are not Gaussian. Uh, and again, this is kind of different from what you see in the in the Wigner case. And in that case, is a theorem of Borgata and Yao that any eigenvector entry is kind of is kind of Gaussian. Okay, so uh, there have been no previous results still on the sharp transitions for the the, the, the sharp transition uh, over the mobility years. So this is what I want to what I want to talk about here. Okay, so um, maybe but first I'll give you a little bit of background on these mobility edges. So as I mentioned before, these are sharp transitions from delocalized to, to localized eigen eigen uh, eigenvectors. So a typical example, almost a prototypical example, is that is a random Schrodinger equation on, on a graph. So this is um, this is defined to be so I take some Hamiltonian H, which is defined to be some theta. You can do as some strength parameter. This is something you can vary if you want. It's like my alpha uh, times a times a V, and V is going to be a random diagonal matrix. So it's just diagonal matrix with ID entries. Okay, and then lambda, uh, this delta is a uh, the graph of Um Okay, and this is kind of meant to model dynamics of an electron in a, in a disorder medium. Okay, so if the graph is say ZD and, and, and D is at least three, then and and and, and the, the strength, the sort of the, the strength of the noise, the theta is sufficiently small, you should exhibit a mobility edge. So near the extreme eigenvalues, you should have Poisson statistics and, and localization, kind of uh, the analog of what you, you see here. Near the extreme ones, you should have localization and Poisson. And um, uh, this has been proven to a, to a great extent by people in this audience, for like Polish uh, and Spencer in, in, in 1983, Asim and Molchanov 10 years later with a, a, a different proof. They showed the localization aspect. The Poisson aspect was also shown by Minami. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, and uh, the other end, so if I look sort of in the middle of the spectrum, I should see the opposite behavior, kind of a GOE statistics and localization. This is, this is very much open. In the context of, of, of this of, of this uh, random Schrodinger uh, equation, and once again, there should be a sharp transition from one to the other. Uh, again, this is very much. Okay, so there are other models, though. I mean, this is this is uh, the random Schrodinger operator on, on, on the lab. This is one model. There, there are a number of other models which you should have a mobility edge. So one is the um, random Schrodinger operator on a tree graph. So uh, here. Uh, you also have kind of the, the localization, the Poisson statistics and localization is, is have, have, have been well well understood. Concerning the localization, the, the delocalization and more is known. So it was shown by Klein in, in 1998 that you have a re, some regime of, of delocalization. And this, this beautiful work of Eisenman and Marcel showed we gave a criterion for both localization and delocalization in terms of a certain function phi, uh, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit more later. And basically, this, the criterion is that uh, you're, you're if you, something's up right, um, you're delocalized if this phi is positive and localized if this phi is, is negative. Um, so this is extremely, I mean, this is this is a very useful criteria and extremely suggestive of a mobility edge. The one kind of thorn uh, thorn in the bush, so to speak, is that this phi, you don't have, a, you don't have much control on it. So in principle, you worry that it might be discontinuous or in fact that it might be zero. And if it's zero, then on, on say an interval, then you can't actually, you can't distinguish between, between these two. But I mean, this is extremely, again, suggestive of, of, the, of the fact that you should have a mobility edge. The moment like phi is analytic, uh, if, you, if you knew something like that, it would, it would directly apply it. Um, so yeah, okay, so then they were showing, so BAPS had used this criterion to sort of bound the endpoints of localization and delocalization. These bounds don't, are not the same for any finite D, but they kind of get closer and closer as you make the degree of the tree uh, get bigger. 
later. Okay, so uh, another example where you should see these mobility edges are in the context of random band matrices. So if you make, um, okay, I won't say much, uh, this is quick comment, uh, so I won't, I won't say much on these. So if you, if you take a random band matrix whose dimension is at least three and the width is bounded, you should also see a mobility edge. Uh, so uh, this is very much open as well. Um, the, the most relevant and, and, and recent work in this direction is due to Yang, Yao, and Yin, who consider dimension D at least seven, and they consider the width to be actually diverging. So in this regime, actually, what will happen if, if the width is diverging, this sort of delocalized region, as the width gets bigger and bigger, this delocalized region will start to exhaust the full spectrum. So you will not see mobility edge there. And what they showed is indeed, uh, you have uh, deep local, some delocalization throughout the spectrum. Um, and these band matrices have also been studied at dimension D equals one. Here you don't see a mobility edge, although there are many interesting results in this, this direction. Again, the, the other example is the, uh, the case of lobby matrices. Um, and this is what I wanna, what I wanna talk about in, in uh, the remainder of this talk. Okay, so I talked about a lot about delocalization and local, localization, but I never actually told you uh, how, how, like I never gave you a formal definition of it. So I'll give you two. One of them is kind of my preferred definition, although it's not obvious a priori, if you haven't seen this before, that this has anything to do with eigenvectors. So I'll give you kind of the clean definition that it's a priori unrelated, and then I'll show you how to relate, relate it to eigenvectors. Okay, so, um, so let's fix some com complex number. Uh, so you, you view E as some fixed number, and E is kind of where you're probing. So you can view it as where you're probing um, the eigen, eigenvector. So, so like you're probing an eigenvector with eigenvalue around E. So, and then you let Z, or maybe it's really kind of Z eta, it's E plus I eta. So I'm just, take, I'm just taking this point E and just shifting a little bit off in the complex plane. Okay, then you define the resolvent to be uh, H minus Z inverse. So again, since H is symmetric and Z is slightly in the complex plane, you can invert it, right? Um, uh, okay, so these entries, these entries are GJJ, so these diagonal entries, GJJ, if I range over J, they're identical, they're IID, right? Because H, the, all the entries of H were IID. So, Okay, so the resultant, so the resultant formulation of, of delocalization uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll use is the following. Okay, so uh, localization means that if I take, so all, the first thing you should do is kind of let n tend to infinity. So let the size of this matrix tend to infinity. And the next thing you, you do is you let eta tend to zero. So you kind of get closer and closer to this point E. And you ask yourself whether this diagonal entry is, has, is like kind of real or kind of strictly in the, in, in the upper half plane. So if it's if it's basically real, so if you look at the imaginary part of this diagonal, uh, this diagonal entry, you let n tend to infinity, and then you let eta tend to zero, so that you converge to this point. Uh, if it's real, then you say we're, we're localized at e, and if it's not if it's not real, so if there's it has some imaginary part, uh, then you say it's delocalized at e. Okay. Okay. So okay. So this is a very clean definition, although it might you might you might ask what this has to do with an eigenvector. Okay, so uh, there's an identity. I mean, so you can take the spectral decomposition of your of your matrix, right? So I mean, this matrix has your matrix H has some eigenvectors, uh, which I'll call UK. It has some entries U1, K, U2, K, L, <laughs> K, with eigenvalue lambda K. So I mean, it shouldn't surprise you that you can write any entry of this matrix in terms of these eigenvectors, and through that you can translate this definition in terms of a certain inverse participation ratio. Uh, Okay, so uh, okay, so let me just give you what you get if you directly insert this into this. Okay, so um, okay, so you define this inverse participation ratio as follows. So you let p, so you fix some interval i. So you imagine i is kind of some small interval around e. Okay, so you're probing the eigen, you're going to probe the eigen vectors with eigenvalues in this interval i. Okay, okay, so then you look at this uh, p i of j for any j. You look at uh, Right. Okay. This should uh, this should say lambda i as in lambda i. So okay. But you look at okay. So you look at all of the entries of okay. So um, right. So you look at n divided by the number of eigenvalues in this interval i times the sum of the uh, the jth components of all the eigenvectors whose eigenvalue whose whose eigenvalues are on i. So this should read lambda i as in lambda. This should read lambda i. This is lambda j. Okay. And then you kind of take the average of these pi's. So, okay, you don't need to, I'm not going to really use this for the remainder of the talk. I just want to quickly say that uh, this is a signature of, of uh, a signature of delocalization is if QI is bounded as I becomes smaller and smaller, you can kind of see this by just looking against the, the flat vector. If everything is n to the minus one half, you can quickly convince yourself that QI is one. 
a signature of, of localization is that as kind of as this i shrinks, uh, this qi tends to infinity. Again, you can kind of see this by the coordinate vector. You can convince yourself without too much effort that uh, that qi is tending to infinity as i shrinks. So, okay, now if you kind of plug this definition in here, this sort of this this definition into this, you'll see that localization. This notion, this resolving notion of localization on e, implies exactly the signature of delocalization. And uh, sorry, this the signature of localization, and this resolvent criterion describes this signature of localization. So okay, so from now on, I will mainly just think about the resolvent, this resolvent thing. So again, localization is when the resolvent kind of stays real. Delocalization is when the resolvent has some non-trivial imaginary part. But I just wanted to explain all the sort of inverse participation ratio stuff to to say that. This does mean something in terms of eigen actual eigenvectors as well. So to be clear, if, if the eigenvectors are supported on like n to the 0.99 coordinates, that counts as delocalization. That counts as localization because there's some oh, yeah, 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 yeah. correct. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. There are ways of trying to make trying to make this more effective, but I will not do that here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me now say some 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 results about the mobility edge. So uh, okay, we'll let H be an n by n Levy matrix with some parameter alpha in zero one. And I remind you that we had this lambda of E way back uh, back here. Um, yeah, so you, we had this lambda of E, which was if lambda of E is one, then that should be the location of the mobility edge. Okay. Um, right. So okay, now the same is the following. So if E is satisfied, if E is set up lambda E is bigger than one. Then you're delocalized at E, then either you sort of if I take some point in the spectrum so that lambda E is strictly bigger than one, then you're delocalized at E. And if E on the contrary, if E satisfies, um, if E is sort of okay, so this 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 one will require a little bit of, of explanation. So if E is bigger than the maximum E, so that lambda of E is bigger than one. So in principle, this lambda of E, uh, so here's one. I could I'm plotting now lambda, I'm plotting now lambda against E. In principle, what could happen, say, is that, you know, okay, okay so I know that, uh, so it turns out that you know that, uh, this is uh, uh, yeah. you, you know that uh, one can show, based on by the definition that lambda is continuous, it's bigger than one at zero, and it tends to, it tends to zero at infinity. Um, okay, so that means that there is some biggest point for which it's equal to one. So if I look over here now, then you're then the claim is that you're delocalized. Is it just again a definition of lambda? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's the solution to some quadratic equation. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it's it's pretty explicit. If I, I didn't tell you what P was, but it is pretty explicit. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. So here I sorry, here you're you're localized. And in each of these regions, you're delocalized. Okay. So now that doesn't actually tell you what's happening here. And uh, actually, nothing should happen there because these regions do not exist. So uh, if you want to just prove kind of a mobility edge, a sharp transition uh, in, the, in the way they said, that, that would. Um, it suffices to show that this lambda of E has equals one has a unique solution. Then these regions would not exist, and you would have a situation that looks more like so this is delocalized, and this is localized. So you just don't know that the lambda E doesn't ask that little bit. Yeah, right. I mean, this is purely deterministic problem at this stage, right? So yeah, it's a purely you can mark absolutely. That. So I just mentioned this numerically. It's not really <laughs> not oscillating. It's just strictly decreasing. Okay. So now here, can you can you prove that? Okay. So you you can if you assume that alpha is close enough to zero or one. So if alpha is close enough to zero or one, so there exists some c, you know, one, one, one hundredth. So that if alpha is between zero and c, or between one minus c and one, then indeed there is a unique solution. So the picture looks like this. And maybe more interestingly to me is that um, you can actually see how e, this mobility of scales as you approach as you approach alpha is um, zero and one. So if alpha is approaching one, then you can show that e alpha is, gro is growing like uh, one over one minus alpha, so it's going to infinity. And if alpha is going to zero, so if it's it's kind of it's very small. Then and it's 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 behaving like this fairly peculiar function, like log of alpha to the minus two over alpha. 
Okay, so uh, let me actually go back because I, I, I um, as I mentioned before, okay, so this is, as you can see, this is kind of growing and the asymptotic is one over one minus alpha. Now here you see it's, it's very close to zero. And what I claimed was that, what the theorem says is that it's actually behaving like log of alpha to the minus two over alpha. So here, okay, maybe around alpha is equal to 0 0.2, you can see that this thing is almost zero. Well, if you plug in 0 0.2 here, okay, so log of 0.2 is maybe one and a half, raised to the minus two over alpha, that's like 10. So you're doing like 1.5 to the 10, that's okay. Now that, that you can now start to believe that this is actually extremely tiny, which kind of explains why this thing looks so tiny if alpha's if alpha's not too small. I mean, just like a quarter of like point two. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and um, the the point I should, the last point I should make is this is one of a rare example of a rigorous proof and an exact computation of a mobility edge. In fact, I'm not sure if I, if I know of any other. Um, such statement like this in the literature. Um, yeah. So, any questions before I keep going? So, do you do you get information about? I mean, I, I don't know uh, about what happens near the mobility edge. I yeah, think. we we didn't we didn't go for that. So, so um, you can probably get some. So, so that, that question is closely related to to how this kind of tends to zero as you approach yeah. the nobility edge. So, yeah, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't try to do that. We probably have some bounds, but we never, uh, the, 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 they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't be close to, to actually physical, physically meaningful, yeah. Yeah, any further questions? Uh, yeah, please. But on trees, uh, there is this interesting phenomenon for regular uh, disorder yeah. uh, that uh, the system likes to dissolve delocalizing the sense that you need the minimal strength of randomness to create the localization. Is Correct. That, is there an analog of that? Absolutely. Here? So that the analog is the statement. So okay, you, you view, you view um, your theta, your strength, as my one over alpha. Okay. So the claim is that if alpha is big enough, then you don't see any localization at all. And that's here, right? If alpha is between one and two, then the whole thing is extended. Yeah. So it's only when alphas, if alphas less than one, where you see, oh, and this is still infinite variance, by the way. So um, it's only when alphas less than one where you see things start to start to, to look, have some localization regimes. So that's what I consider the analog of, of, of those changes. I mean, to some extent, elder strain graphs are analogs of tree-like yeah. behavior. Yeah. And there is a similarity. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there too. You will, so I, I'll prior, you might say there's no spatial structure in this model. There will be a spatial structure. And I'll, I'll explain that next. In fact, you need the spatial structure in order to prove this result. So yeah. Um, okay, so uh, before I keep going, are there any other questions? Okay, so then I'll keep going. Okay, so this is actually, okay, I'll get to the spatial structure right now, in fact. So instead of setting this H directly, we'll analyze an operator on an infinite tree. Okay, so this is directly in relation to Michael's question. So what you can view is you can view this, this, this operator as sort of a local weak limit of H. So, okay, H is a matrix, so what do I mean by a local weak limit. Um, what I mean is the following. So you have a um, you have a H, which is some matrix. You can view this H as the adjacency matrix of a of a sort of a a complete graph, right? So I have all these vertices. Okay, I drew too many in retrospect. Okay, so I have I have a lot of vertices, and then they're all connected. Okay, I didn't draw. Um, but and then each each edge is weighted by the, the the entry basically the entry. So this is i and j. The edge is weighted by h i j. Okay. So then I have some sort of this big network. Okay. And then what you do is you um, you cut off all of the edges which are not big enough. So most of the edges. Remember, I scaled down the matrix by n to the minus one over alpha. So most of the entries are of order n to the minus one over alpha, which is kind of negligible, right? So let me fix some epsilon bigger than zero, say one one thousand. And I cut off all the entries that are less than less than epsilon. So then, once you have once you do this, you're left with kind of a um, no, maybe I only have this. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you're left with that, and then you let epsilon tend to zero. So I kind of have more and more edges, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, I let, and then I, um, yeah, I let up something to zero. So what you'll see is that these edges, they form uh, locally, they'll, they'll, they'll locally around some vertex. If I just kind of look locally around some vertex, they'll look like a tree. So I, I'm not going to prove this fact, but I mean, it, it is a statement that if you do this procedure, what you'll get is something that looks like a tree. 
So let me be a little bit more precise. So this tree is gonna have sort of infinite degree. Okay, so I'm gonna have this weighted tree T. It's vertex set you should view as, um, so I have this root, which I'll call zero. And then it's connected to infinitely many guys here, which I'll label by the integers. Okay, and then each, each of these is connected in terms of infinitely many things, which I'll call like one, two, one, 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 two, et cetera. And then each of these is again connected to infinitely many things. Okay, so I have this, this sort of infinite tree, each vertex of which is infinite. Each, each has infinite degree. Okay, and then as I as I kind of just depicted over here, the children of, of any vertex V are denoted by like V1, V V2, et cetera. So I can I can sort of interpret these vertices as just tuples of integers, of positive integers. Okay, then you define this operator T of V. So this this you should view each each um, each node of the graph as kind of like a an entry, some 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 point in, in this complete graph on which on which this H is acting. Okay. Okay, and then you define this this T this this operator T. So T should kind of tell me what what my HIJs were, right? So what my what my original matrix entries were. So you kind of you can imagine uh, that if you if you take kind of a, a row, or like you look at its you look you you look at its entries, it will kind of form a Poisson point process in a sense. So what you'll do is you'll uh, given each edge, say connecting V to VK, you'll assign a random weight, which I've been on about this C. And this random way to sample by a plus on point process of density alpha over two times x to the minus alpha minus one. So this alpha, you're seeing this alpha appear in the in the plus on point process. This is exactly the, uh, the the tail the, the tail the tail of the of the of the matrix. Okay. So so is, would you I, I got a little bit lost. So would you review how this this uh, this tree structure is formed and, and and the hierarchy for it again? Sorry. Would you review how this tree structure is? This, this, uh, you get the tree from the matrix. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, so you start with the matrix. Yeah. Okay. You pick some vertex. You just pick some vertex, which you'll think of as the root. Okay. I look at. All, I have all of these edges. These, the, every vertex is connected to every vertex up here, right? Yeah. Okay. Then you just erase all of the edges that are less than some epsilon. Oh, less than some epsilon. Less, less than epsilon. Epsilon. So now I only have a, a few edges. Okay. Yeah. These edges will, will, with high probability, form a tree, basically. Yeah. Then you let epsilon tend to zero, and what this will do is this will kind of make every vertex of infinite degree. Yeah. Okay. And then you when you you wait you you just carry over whatever weight was here to this thing. And I'm saying without this will these guys will not form a, a plus on a plus on point process. Each of these kind of these will form a plus on point process with this intensity. So yeah, which is hopefully not too shocking, right? I mean, because all the entries were independent, so they should naturally form a plus on point process. Okay. Okay, so then you define this operator T by just saying that the the, 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 the value of T, the entry of the zero one entry of T is, 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 is given by this C. Okay, so this defines some operator T, which you should view as kind of the limit, the, lo the local limit, so to speak, of my original uh, random matrix of H. Okay, so you define the resolvent as before, exactly as before, just T minus Z inverse, and the resolvent venture is. Um, you read often, as I, as I mentioned before, we had defined localization, delocalization in terms of these resolvent entries. So I'm just going to define the zero zero resolvent entry to be R zero zero of Z. Okay, and it was shown. Uh, it's, it's it's a statement that the original Levy matrix resolvent entry, sort of any if I take any J, it doesn't matter. G J J of Z as that tends to <laughs> converges to this guy. Okay, so this you should indeed view this object as kind of the local weak limit of my of my um, of my original Levy matrix, at least in the sense that if I take any resolvent entry of the Levy matrix, it will converge to this, whatever this thing is. Okay, so remember the, the game is purely now in understanding this R, this sort of infinite object. Okay, and now the, the nice thing about this is that in relation to Michael's questions, this restores some, some levels of, of tree structure, of, of spatial structure to the model through this T. Okay. Okay, so now the proof outline will be as follows. Okay, so the, the, we sort of three, three somewhat distinct steps. The first is to, is to prove a kind of a fractional moment criterion, which is to show that delocalization and localization of my operator at some point E is implied by either the growth or decay of a certain type of fractional moment. Okay, that looks like this. Um, as, as the, as so this, 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 let, me, let me quickly explain what this means. So R0 V, I remind you that R, R is, the resolvent, is the resolvent, so it's this T minus E inverse, so it's in particular, it's an infinite dimensional operator. 
and then I can I can I can just look at a zero V entry for any for any, so like the zero V entry for any two vertices for, for the root root and, and some vertex V. Okay. So now if I let kind of V go deeper and deeper into the tree, I can ask myself whether or not this resolvent entry grows or shrinks. Okay. And whether or not it grows or shrinks will be will, will tell me uh, will tell me whether or not I'm localized or delocalized. So that's the kind of statement that one went after. Okay, and I should say again, this was inspired by uh, by work of Eisenman and Marcel, who proved uh, an analogous criterion for random Schrodinger operators on the tree, which I had mentioned before. That you do need a number of fairly non-trivial adaptations to make this work in the heavy-tailed case, probably due to the fact that the weights are heavy-tailed, and probably due to the fact that the tree is infinite. Okay, so this is step one. Okay, step two is not uh, not so far. This is fairly explicit. I mean, I've told you, okay, if I kind of if I get some handle on the off-diagonal resolvent entries, if I know whether they're growing or shrinking. I can tell you, um, I can tell you whether or not I'm, I'm localized or delocalized, but that doesn't, I need to do something in terms of my original lambda, right? I need to get something more explicit. So uh, the step two is to show that the above kind of inexplicit criterion implies the explicit one. So uh, in terms of whether lambda is bigger or less than one. So this kind of proceeds in, in, in three parts. So the first is to show, um, which I'll, I'll explain, I'll, if I have time, I'll explain a little bit, I'll, I'll explain a little bit at least about this. Okay, so, you, it, it's a, it's, so the argument behind this is, is a priori looks somewhat circular. So you want to show, you want to know whether localization or delocalization holds at E. So you first assume that localization holds at E, and then you show that this rate of, like the rate of decay is given by the sort of, if I look at this, if I look at this fractional moment, its rate of decay is given by the eigenvalue, the top eigenvalue of a certain operator. Okay, and then you compute the top eigenvalue of that operator, and you can, um, there were some ideas in, in, the, in the physics work of Tarkini, Burel, and Tarsha that, 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 that points toward uh, how, how to do this. And then you kind of, I again kind of assumed what I wanted to prove here. So you, you, jump, you kind of uh, circumvent the fact that this is a pure circular by a continuity argument, uh, which is somewhat reminiscent to what you see in kind of local laws and random matrix theory, and this whole universality theory of random matrix theory. Okay, so I'll try to explain them a little bit more if I can later. Uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the last point is, is to talk about the uniqueness and the scaling and the mobility edge. Say that lambda e equals one has a unique solution for alpha equals to zero one and to analyze its scaling. And here actually, the proof doesn't use that kind of uh, explicit formula, it kind of uses a probabilistic interpretation of some of the quantities that you use to define this lambda e. Um, I probably won't have the time to talk about three, but I'll try to say a little bit more about one and two. Um, so should, how long do I have? Okay. So now let me let me try to at least state the fractional moment, sort of step one, uh, the the result involved in this fractional moment criteria. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll let I'll fix some z, which is again uh, you view as some complex number e plus i eta. I'm again thinking of eta getting smaller and smaller, and e kind of being fixed. It's where I'm probing the spectrum, and I take some s, which is between alpha and one. So it turns out that you you do need has to be between alpha and one, which is kind of different from what you see in the tree setting. Um, and you consider uh, the following quantities, okay? So you look at the sum of, I uh, look at the resolvent entry, R zero V of Z. So R, um, Z is indexing the resolvent. It's telling you it's H minus Z, it's T minus Z inverse. And then you look at this R zero V entry, okay? I, I take its S moment and then I sum over all uh, v whose distance to the origin is L. Okay, so I forgot to write equals L here. But you just look at all Vs on the Lth layer of this tree. I look at the fractional moment of this thing. I, I sum, I, or I look at the sort of the S moment of this thing and I sum them all up. I also forgot to include an expectation so that I'm taking a fractional moment. So this should be expectation and this should be equals L. Okay, so this is some quantity. Okay, and then I want to know whether or not how, how it's growing or decaying. So I take its log and I divide by L, okay? And, uh, this L inverse should be inside the limit, obviously. Okay, so uh, L inverse log. So this thing will either, you, you expect it to either grow or decay exponentially in L. So I take its log and divide by L, this will tell me its rate of growth or decay. So this is what I call the spy of S of C. Okay, so the rate of growth or rate of, so this is again, just telling me the, telling me the rate of growth or rate of decay of these uh, fractional moments of the resolvent entry. Okay, so the, the statement is, uh, is as follows. So uh, the, the three of them. The first is that this limit exists and is not increasing in S. Okay. And the second is that the, the sort of the meat, the, 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 the thing that the distinguishing feature is what happens is S tends to one. Okay. So the first thing you do is you take this sort of this, this limit as eta tends to zero. 
and then you had to let S tend to one. And whether or not this is positive or negative is distinguishing between localization and delocalization. So if this thing is strictly positive, then your, your operators delocalize at E. And if you're if if this um if this thing is staying negative for all S between alpha and one, then you're localized at E. So that's the that's the statement. So this is kind of distinguishing localization from delocalization in terms of these somewhat inexplicit fractional moments. Okay. So I mean the effort of this proof mainly consists of the, the first two parts. The, the third is kind of a, a quick consequence of a fairly well-known identity called the Born Identity. And as I mentioned before, uh, this, this work, this, um, there, the, an analogous statement was shown for random Schrodinger operator on tree graphs. Um, and the, the main step, I mean, uh, um, uh, a, key, a key part of the argument that they're using, I don't have the time to explain this kind of fully, fully the argument, although I like it very much, uh, so I'd like to, but um, anyway, so, um, so it uses a, a, a sort of a deterministic bound. This whole, this is not a random bound. This is just a pure, pure estimate about just matrices. Is that I go again? If I want to show delocalization, I want to know that this imaginary part of the resolvent is strictly positive, right? So in principle, I want to lower bound this thing. So okay, so, so it's just a, a linear algebraic statement that you can lower bound this thing by a, a quantity that looks like this. Let me not explain this quantity too much. The key point that you should keep in mind is that you have an R zero B squared here. Okay, so in particular, if I have a, if I have at least one large R zero B, then you can imagine that you can you can kind of get some some lower bound of this quantity. So you want some large if you want imaginary part of R to be large, maybe I want one of these R's these these off diagonal entries to be large. Okay, so you want to find one large or what they call a resonant off diagonal entry of the resolvent entry. Okay, and a point that I just want to make is that all I know from this. This quantity here is that you know about the moments. I, unfortunately, I forgot to write a very important e here, expectation here. But uh, you should keep that in mind. You only know about this. This phi is only check the moments. But then I want to know that something is large with high probability. So I want to say that if the expectation of something is high, then with high probability, the thing itself is high. And this is and this is uh, the other way going over the other way around. If I know the expectation is small, I can easily deduce that the thing is small. You know, going the other way around is significantly less uh, significantly less obvious. And for them, they use a second moment method. And you can imagine that if I have a heavy tailed operator on an infinite tree, the second moment argument will just break. And indeed, that's what that, that's what happens here. So this needs uh, rather serious modifications to get around in the uh, in this in, in this heavy tail case that I that I that I described. Um, so that that estimate you had uh, this inequality is this yeah. related to a word identity too or not? Uh, this is it's it's I wouldn't call it a word identity. It's not an, I, I see it's an inequality, but um, yeah, it's not. It's not, I wouldn't call it a word identity. It's kind of like you. Um, that's the easiest way to say. I mean, it's kind of closer to the Schrock compromise. Okay. Yeah, it's closer to the Schrock. And this R zero zero squared. It's kind of like the denominator of Schrock complement in squared in a sense. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me skip. I was going to go into a little bit more detail here, but I'd maybe rather not due to time. Um, uh, so okay. So the next step I, I, I mentioned was kind of the explicit calculations. Um, okay. So. Uh, okay, so th there are two kind of ingredients that are used in these explicit calculations, and actually these two ingredients are also used in the proof of the previous proposition. Um, so the first is a tree expansion, which tells me how do I write an off diagonal entry in terms of diagonal resolvent entries. So I imagine that I have this tree, which is shown over here. Okay, so I have a tree. So, okay, so the claim is the following. Let's say I want to compute the resolvent entry uh, from zero to some point B. Okay, the claim is that this, so I want to compute like R zero B. The claim is that you can compute this thing. If I call the parent of V, I'll call this V minus. Okay, so the claim is that this, was, this can be expressed as R zero V minus. So the resolvent entry between these two guys times the weight of this edge times the diagonal resolvent entry here. Okay, so this is some explicit formula. Again, that, this is actually a deterministic statement. This is, my <laughs> this is a purely deterministic statement. Um, so this, in principle, if I if I iterate this, I can kind of chop. I can, you know, I, I write this as this times this times this. Um, I can write. I can iterate. I can write this as this times this times this. And I, I keep going. So I can kind of iterate this and, and write everything in terms of purely diagonal resolvent entries. Okay, and then the second thing is the short complement identity, uh, which allows me to 
gives me some formula for these diagonal resolved entries. So it tells me that R, this RVV, is expressible as um, okay, as some uh, some inverse quantity. Okay, so I, I won't go mainly impressionistic at this stage. Uh, so this S of V you should view as some some somewhat complicated sum, I guess. So it's 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 minus it's minus Z plus um, plus some uh, some linear combination of other off-diagonal resolvent entries. So, okay, the point of this though is that I have some way of kind of expressing an off-diagonal resolvent entry as a product of diagonal resolvent entries. And I have some other identity that allows me to kind of compute the diagonal resolvent entries. So, um, okay, so you can imagine that I, if I combine them, I'll have some way of kind of recursively computing uh, this guy in terms of this guy times something explicit. And then I can compute this guy in terms of this guy times something explicit. And then I can keep going. Okay, so I can recursively evaluate uh, this 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 di off diagonal resolvent entry this way. Okay, and the thing that you kind of need to know is the law of this of this S, which I didn't actually define to you. It's something explicit, but you need to know what the law of this S is. So I'm going to call the law of this S or some minor modification of the of the, the law P of Z. Okay, so then what you can do is if you kind of put everything I said together and then make, a, make, a, make an equation out of it, you'll find that this kind of operator, this sort of repeated action of peeling off one edge at a, at a time can be packaged into a transfer operator or an operator from functions to functions. And these functions you should view as kind of some probability density of this S, or morally speaking, okay? So you kind of, you kind of view this R as a function of, of some, some, some random variable Associated with this vertex here, and then I, I iterate this, and I kind of update. I update this. I update this on each stage, and you can package this all into a transfer operator, which I've written down explicitly over here. Okay, and then you can imagine if I keep on iterating on this transfer operator, then I'll, the, the 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 size of this thing, the rate of growth of this thing, will behave like the top eigenvalue of this operator. So indeed, this is kind of what I was saying before back here. Was that um, was that if localization holds up, so so the rate of decay or growth of this thing is determined by some parent for Venus operator, or some eigenvalue, some of some explicit operator. And that explicit, that almost explicit operator is given by 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 this by this thing here. It's just that the kind of the the fly the fly in the milk, so to speak, is that the, so the issue is that this this law is not explicit in general. Um, so. Okay, so this is where you use, if you assume that localization holds, then you can make this law explicit. You can, you can make the law of this kind of, this S or this S explicit. And then you can actually write down an operator that is explicit. And um, you, can, you can prove this proposition here, which says that if you assume that you have some kind of localization, so if you assume that the matter actually does tend to zero, then this rate of growth, this e to the phi, is given by the top eigenvalue of this operator. And furthermore, you can actually compute that thing in, in terms of this lambda. So, um, so I should say that the second part of the, the second part, the sort of computation, it was kind of implicit in the work of Tarkini, Burrell, and Tarjo, although almost ironically, they were they were using it for a somewhat different purpose. They were they were doing fairly non-rigorous things. They had they were doing some replica symmetric computation, but in the process of doing that, they actually implicitly computed an eigenvalue of this operator. So we were happy about that. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll skip further details and, and uh, quickly summarize. So random matrices with finite variance entries exhibit a striking universality. You have these sort of eigenvectors are, are delocalized, and in fact, you have, they can kind of converge to these guess random variables. These local statistics converge to these GOE uh, local, local limits. Um, Levy matrices are, are variants of these that have, uh, whose entries have alpha heavy tails, so they have infinite variance. And if alpha is between one and two, then you qualitatively see the same thing that you have in the, in the, in the GOE case, in the, in the bigger case. Everything is kind of delocal, all the eigenvectors are delocalized, and you have GOE level spacings everywhere on the spectrum. Now, uh, if alpha is between one, zero, and one, then you have a, what we showed is that you have a mobility edge separating delocalization from localization at an explicit threshold or mobility edge that is calculated in terms of this lambda. And the three steps involved were showing some fractional moment criterion for when you can distinguish localized states from delocalized states in terms of resolvent growth or decay, some explicit um, formula that enables you to transfer this inexplicit criterion into the explicit one in terms of lambda. And the thing that I didn't really mention at all was kind of this uniqueness of the solution to this lambda equals one equation. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention.
Have a question? Yeah. So can you see a similar story with even a simpler, uh, say instead of doing a, um, you know, an alpha uh, tail distribution, you just have with some tiny probability, you get a large value. Yeah, so, it's small. Yeah, so um, you could do that and, and in that situation, it's just a tiny, tiny probability, right? Uh -huh. How, what is that? What do you, so yeah, you can, you can do that. So if you have, you have to tune that probability perfectly. Yeah. If you tune that probability perfectly, what you'll get is actually more complicated, is, is, is a model for which I do not expect this mobility edge to be explicit. You'll get some kind of hybrid between an Erda Schrenny graph and like a GOE basically. So you imagine like uh -huh. your, your, your entries are kind of Gaussian, but then like with, with probability say one over N, um, my entry is, is much bigger. Right. Yeah, so that, that thing you can, uh, heuristically speaking, what it will behave like is kind of a, the adjacency matrix of a random graph plus just a driving GOE. Uh -huh. And that object uh, um, has not been studied. And I'm actually not sure to what extent it would have a mobility edge. I would, I would imagine it would have one, but I wouldn't know how to prove it offhand. But I mean, you know, as far as intuition, if I understand that model, do I sort of morally understand what's yeah. happening here? Well, well, I mean, what's on the level, of, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that that no, no, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, sort of intuitively, yeah. So, yeah, if you, I don't think there's a rigorous way to go back and forth between them, but sort of that model qualitatively should have more morally very similar features to this one. Right. Yeah. Um, does the same questions make sense for random permission? Matrices. Yeah, yeah. I think all, even the most of many of the results should go through there too. Yeah. But will you still be able to reduce <laughs> to the analysis on the tree? Yeah, it would. It would still be able to reduce the analysis on the tree. Yeah. Yeah. And going to the trees, uh, do you in the process also prove uh, continuity uh, of the Lyapunov exponent? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so okay, right. So that's a good question. So you mean this file, right? Yeah. yeah. So what you show, you show you, the lambda is continuous. So what you show is that um, so there are two regimes here. Okay, so you have this. So you have this. Um, this is one. Okay. So I, you look at the place where lambda, where lambda, lambda is explicit, right? So lambda is big, was lambda is bigger than one. Okay. Um, so in this region. You can actually just show that lambda the phi is equal to lambda. In this region, I have no idea. I, I, I cannot compute. I cannot, I, I don't I don't know what, what phi is. So in this region, yes, you know it's continuous by virtue of the fact that it's in fact equal to lambda. In this region, I actually I'm not I we didn't and I didn't really try to be honest because we didn't need it, uh, show that, that that phi is continuous. So in fact, uh, maybe in, 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 in one more comment in relation to your question, is that I say that you know that phi is continuous because lambda equals phi here. Actually, to prove lambda equals phi here, you need to show directly that lambda is that phi by the phi is continuous. <coughs> In fact, I made a. I mean, some of the proofs are by contradiction, which may be part of the problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I, yeah. Um, that's true. Oh, but no, actually, here though. Here, yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah, here you're kind of okay. In fact, this lemma here it says that this phi e is uniformly continuous when it's negative. So you can show that it's, you can show it's continuous when it's negative, but actually I haven't tried. We didn't need it to show that it's continuous when it's not negative. But yeah, uh, maybe useful to add for for those who know the mechanism. If I understand correctly, that, that uh, it connects to and is the localization is caused by the process of the resonant localization. So it. Having absolutely continuous states or delocalized states pollutes the argument. But if the states are localized, would be localized, you can actually compute the uh, tapping amplitude and the effects of rare events, which would cause uh, hybridization between dis distant states. So the proof here is by, uh, by contradiction. This calculation is enabled if you ignore the possible effects of imaginary part of the resolvent. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Then you can compute things. Yeah. And then you show that actually it has to be there has to be an imaginary part. Otherwise we would have the hybridization. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There it's extended states. Yeah. That's right. So are there natural critical exponents uh, that, that one can 
I mean, I can ask Michael the same question. Uh, at, at the mobility edge? Uh, uh, are there, so are there conjectured or approved critical exponents? This is the kind of thing which only the speaker can do. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you've thought about it also, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, I mean, you, it's believed that you should have some kind of fractal, multi fractal behavior of the eigenvalues <clears throat> there. Like if I look at the mobility edge and the eigenvector at the mobility edge should kind of be halfway between localized and delocalized, which have like up some power law decay. Now, what that power law is, is extremely unclear to the physicists as well. They've tried to run extensive simulations on this point and for this mobile, for this lobby model. And it's not, it's not clear what it is. Another thing that's not clear is if you take like um, the, 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 the local statistics around this mobility edge, I can look at how the correlations decay and this should be some power law presumably, but what, the, what that exponent is, is again, not computable and it's not clear if it's universal. So based on their simulations, but again, these things are pretty hard to simulate because it's just happening at a single point. Is these guys uh, Turkey do these kinds of things? Or? Yeah, that's right. They can get to pretty high dimensional matrices by just, yeah, they can, they can actually get fairly large dimensional matrices, but even then it's, it's pretty unclear. You're only looking at one point, right? So it's, yeah. yeah. It's hard to get. Yeah. If you change the value of uh, lambda i in the localized phase, do you um, is it like expected that the amount of localization will change in some continuous way? Yeah, that's right. So it does, and that's that's uh, that is determined by this. Morally speaking, that's determined by this phi actually. So. Uh, Five, like a real exponent. Yeah, you, you kind of. I mean, yeah. So this this phi is kind of going to govern the how localized you are, how kind of how quickly the other entries will kind of tend to zero. So indeed, if 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 um, if you're in the localized phase, you can actually kind of sort of compute this in terms of the lambda. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that I, I guess I should know, but I, I, I so you have to you have to work with fractional moments, but you also have to understand. What happens as the factor moment goes to one? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Is that also in your work? Yeah, they yeah. also did that. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not increasing in S actually. So somehow you shouldn't you shouldn't freak out too much about this. So as you get toward one, yeah, it's 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 a priori it's not counterintuitive. But yeah, I mean like at one this thing will diverge, but as you approach one, it's it's, it's not increasing. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was nothing. Actually, another question. Okay, if there's no question. Okay.